Which end do you want to tie in first? Go where that tree is, we go across there. Real medicine is all around you. How long have you been seeing Oscar as a doctor? <laughs> long time. You have a heart bypass or you got a heart attack? I had a heart attack. You have a stent? They put a stent in you? It's all that fried catfish. That's it. You know, I'm a big eater, you know. I know you are. <laughs> Patients are complex individuals. How often do you see him in the office? He's been under such great control, I just see him like every four to six months. He's good about taking his medicine. Oh, yeah. Right now, my official title is resident physician in neurosurgery at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. How many of these hooks do we put on this line? These sorts of interactions, they're extensions of the exam room. Baiting them up there. Yeah, we're baiting them up. I didn't gain that understanding until my third year of medical school when I rotated here. It was during my family medicine rotation that I met Oscar Lovelace and the catfish king of Newberry County. Come on. I started a solo practice here on August 1st of 1988. Prosperity is a little rural community in South Carolina. It's where my grandfather and my great-grandfather and my father were reared. There's a little rock church. They gathered the rock in that church to, to help build it. How you doing? I like your ride. It's a place you might run into someone that you know at the grocery store or across the street into the hospital. Everyone around here knows who Oscar is. How's it going, man? I got somebody to introduce you to. This is Mark Picol. Hey, sir. How are you? He's a student working with me. Nice to meet you. The way that someone would understand our practice, we're like the old school family doctor. We take care of people in the office, the hospital, the nursing home and do home visits. And I am so glad to see you, and I want uh, this young doctor to understand the value of family medicine. We are more than the sum of our parts. I not only take care of that patient, but I take care of that patient's mother, that patient's father, that patient's child. You know, when you treat a sweetheart like this, everybody cares about mama. Mm. That fellow over there, yeah. you met Buddy. Yeah. And this is Angela, and this is Ann's daughter. Okay. And I had the privilege of delivering her children. Wow. <laughs> How old are they now? 30 and 26. Oh my gosh. Yes. Now this is great. Continuity. I think it's the most underappreciated aspect of medicine. The continuity of care over the lifespan. This is Mr. Wallace Hunter, Miss Fanny Hunter, and they've been my nice patients for over 20 years. Okay. For the most part, rotating, it's a very controlled environment. Dr. Picolt, he's finished medical school, but he's still in his training. You're kind of attached to a team of physicians, residents, other trainees, other medical students. Do you feel like you're getting any stronger, Wallace? I'm getting a little bit better with my appetite. Here, Oscar is saying, you're gonna be my eyes and ears out there. It's me and you, so I'm really relying on you. What's the workup you do? Well, he's had a colonoscopy and an EGD. And it was completely new to me as a medical student. I remember my first day, it was a wake-up call. I was on call and he said, you know, you're gonna go around at the hospital and I'll meet you there, and you're gonna kind of show me all the patients and show me your plan, and then we'll go from there. And I meet him for breakfast, and I'm like, okay, you know, first patient, A, this is their hemoglobin, this is their hematocrit, you know, here's their white count, and, uh, you know, it went up, you know, two points, and this decreased by one point. And he just, like, stood back, and he was like, you know, what, what is going on with this patient? And I, like, had no answer. 
I think one of the interesting things is when a student comes back to present the patient to me, I've been caring for this patient for 30 years. I know so much about this patient, about their family, about their economic situations, about the worst time in their life, about the best time in their life. As a medical student, you're going into the computer and it's like boom, 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 like labs, you know, overnight events, uh, new imaging, and it's like you have your algorithm. It's just, I had no idea what was actually going on with the patient. So that was my first day. And then, um, you know, it just kind of got more chaotic. There is never a typical routine day. There's always something very unique that happens. You're gonna round on patients in the morning, see any new admissions that have come in through the ED. In the meantime, you're gonna come back to clinic and we've got a whole afternoon of scheduled patient visits. You're at the nursing home rounding on patients that Oscar's in charge of. By the way, you know, this patient called in and said she has a fever, we may go check on her. And interspersed in there, we may have a delivery or two that comes in at the hospital and we'll get in the truck and go deliver a baby. Mark, we gotta go, it's late. It's late. There's a rupture there, we gotta go, seriously. There's a, there's a cop. I know, I know. Lee, seriously, I got, I got a lady in labor. I'm the sheriff. I understand Dr. Lovelace and how he gets about. I'm not gonna necessarily say it's unsafe speeds, but uh, uh, he does that quite often. He's bringing life into the world. You realize medicine isn't confined to the hospital or the clinic. It takes place kind of everywhere in between, and this place gives you an appreciation for that. I'm coming home. All right. So taking Mark catfishing with the Catfish King is not only a great experience, but it's a doctor and a patient sharing an experience that brings them closer together. Put that tayaka sauce in there, you get high potatoes, onion, and cook it in a pot, man, that's some good stuff. I have to say that that's something I'm really concerned about with the changes in medicine. There's been a breakdown in some of those relationships. It's what's happening all across America. Integration and scale makes economic sense in every single industry. But it's not just what lowers costs or what creates data and quality, it's value as well. And we have to think about the psychological value to doctors. We have to think about the value to patients. Where I see it meet the road is, you know, we see patients all the time in the emergency room with brain tumors, with aneurysms, with complex neurological disorders, they don't have a primary care physician. If I see someone in the emergency room, I don't know what's going on. And in an ideal world, you know, I'd call up Oscar and say, hey, you know, what's going on with this patient? And they can tell me in a second. Those relationships, those kind of networks are dissipating. I think we got one. We got one? Yeah. Hot dog. <laughs> I got her, ain't no doubt about that. All right now. They don't call him the king for nothing. Can you make stew out of that? Oh yeah. I've thought a lot about, you know, is this just learning the lesson that we've been told our whole lives of there's wisdom out in the country. We got a catfish. Uh-uh. Oh, wow. <laughs> Who'd you get it with, Mark? We got it with the king. With the king. <laughs> but I use the stuff that I learned during this rotation every single day as a neurosurgeon. <laughs> we think as doctors, what's holding us back is technology. Or if we only had this drug, if we only had this treatment, you know, we'd be able to cure this disease. But so much of what's holding us back is far simpler. It's bridging the gap to the patient. And I'll never forget that.